Okay, speeding. Okay, speeding. speeding. All right. I'm gonna blast through this. Where are we gonna take the IPO and then DFL? Oh, let me just try. The right place to start, like I'm 18 years old, sitting on my parents. It's 1995. I'm 18 years old, sitting on my parents' couch in Salt Lake City, Utah. I just graduated from high school, watching The Price is Right. Right here in this room, I just had this dumb idea. Like how funny would it be to have a bean bag like this big? So I got off the couch, drove down to Joanne's Fabrics. I find the clearance table, just like this, bunch of remnants, all that should work. Rolled it out right here on this floor and drew out a giant figure eight like a baseball. Begins sewing it up, jam the machine. My girlfriend's mom finishes sewing it up, gives it back and now I've got to stuff it. We searched through all our garages. Storage areas looking for things and found my parents camping mattresses like a yellow piece of foam rolled up with a bungee cord chopped those up into strips then into squares stuffed those in now it's awesome it's squishy everywhere I take it everybody loves it it was a vinyl sack that was black and tan and felt good to lay on definitely different than what we sell now and that was the original sack that started this whole thing I'm in my first semester at the University of Utah and I put school on hold, wrap up the giant not bean bag in plastic, put it in the garage because I'm gonna about to ship off on a mission for my church to Taiwan, where I'm going to spend two years teaching about my religion, doing service. It's an amazing experience. I become fluent in Mandarin Chinese. Fast forward to 1998, I come home from this mission and I'm getting back into school, getting back into dating, real life, and my friends are going to the drive-in movies. I'm reminded, oh my gosh, I have this thing. It's in my parents' garage, let me go find it. And I need help getting it out, and I look over the fence at my neighbors, and this dude's under the car. He asked me to help him pull this giant beanbag out from where it was being stored and hose it off and kind of get it ready so he could use it again. We became friends kind of after that, you know, over the next year. and. Um, really formed a good bond and kind of led to us being partners eventually. When I came home from my mission and began university, got to live in my parents' basement, which was a converted ballet studio. So it was right here on the floor of my mom's dance studio that I was able to roll out huge long rolls of fabric. And then I had this string tied to a Sharpie marker with a different knot in the string for each size of sack. So we'd either kneel on it or kind of step on it with our foot and then reach over and we were able to draw the arc of the figure eight here, cut them out, uh, roll them up in pairs, deliver those to a seamstress who lived up the street, and then we'd you know, maybe pick them up on a Thursday, drive downtown to the now Love Sack factory in the back of that furniture factory to stuff them. I need a name for this company to sell it to them. I you know, love peace, hate war, love bag, love sack, that's cool. I just thought it was kind of funny especially what he called it, a love sack. That was really funny. In 1998, Love Sack begins as a company. Right here, which is now just this empty, blown out construction lot, this was Intermountain Furniture. They were so kind as to lease us some space to run the Love Sack factory. And I yellow page, this is long before Google, yellow paged, you know, furniture manufacturer, sofa manufacturer, because I knew there was foam inside of sofas. And sure enough, it led me to Intermountain Furniture. I knocked on their door, went into their funky little office. They had all this scrap foam. And they said, hey, if you'll sweep it up and kind of clean it up once a week, you could buy it from us for like five cents a pound. We had no way to shred foam. So I was literally on my hands and knees using one of these paper cutters, you know, like you chop paper with, cutting these strips of foam. Sean and I were just kind of scrappy. We did whatever we had to do, uh, whether it was design something, cut something, shred something, build a factory, sell, deliver. We rigged up, I remember, this giant funnel. We took some of the vinyl that we made sacks out of and sewed it into a giant kind of bag that I, that I hooked uh, to eyelets on the ceiling and could raise up with a rope and we'd essentially fill this giant bag full of this chopped foam and then connect the sack on the bottom end of it. It was terrible. It was like the worst operation you've ever seen in your life. By about the fifth bag, I was down here picking it up. I said, hey, do you have any way to shred this stuff up? He's like, oh yeah, come back here. We've got this old foam shredder, but it was actually a, a, a grain grinder. So like kind of like a wood chipper you'd use in your backyard, but they hadn't used it since like the 80s. And so he said, you know, if you can get this thing working, 
uh, you, can, you can come in in the afternoons and shred foam right back here. It's still here, check this out. This old concrete structure with this funky roof. That's all that's left of Intermountain Furniture where we used to uh, work every day. We used to pilfer the racks at Joann's Fabrics and other retail fabric stores every week. We'd roam the whole valley looking for sale fabrics and things that we could afford. Most of the sacks were for order, right? Like someone would order their high school colors or collegiate colors or like, you know, obviously decorative colors for their living room. And we'd just make them to order. But sometimes we'd get creative and just like pull fabrics off the rack, make a cool looking sack, leopard print, yellow and black. We hung a sign up on the building to let everybody know where we were and that that, that was our factory, which was kind of a cool time. I uh, still don't think we had made any money at that point, but, uh, but that was our official first kind of office and factory. We're so old that when I finally got in there on a forklift, it, the forklift fell through the floor with me on it. Instead of two weeks of, of cutting up foam in my parents' basement, it only took about an hour to fill a sack. We could roll it right around the corner, out the roll-up door, into the Love Sack van, which is actually my parents' 1979 Dodge, you know, kidnapper van that like uh, they gave to me finally because the engine stopped working. So we rebuilt the engine, spray painted the van with the logo Love Sack, and we were in business. The original logo was drawn by a friend of Sean's uh, with a little bit of Hawaii influence to it and kind of drawn on a piece of lined paper with a crayon and we just ran with it from there. Here we are at the Student Union Building at the University of Utah where I was in college and we registered for our first ever proper sale on Love Sacks. Paid like, I don't know, 200 bucks for a 10 by 10 space on this very lawn. We laid out a few sacks, different sizes, different colors, pretty much all the sacks we had on hand. Had a clipboard, played some Bob Marley on a boom box, and people just flocked, man. Hung out for hours, so much fun. We became quickly like the Love Sack guys, rocking t-shirts around campus. We probably sold, I don't know, 15, 20 sacks that day, and it's kind of our breakout moment. I met Sean at an event at the University of Utah. He was already graduated, but I was there with some friends. He was there with some friends at like a Love Sack event. He had, you know, he had very normal hair, which is weird because Sean never has normal hair. But he had like a normal, nice haircut, a little bit spiky on top. Pretty clean cut. Get this, he used to wear collared shirts. He never went anywhere without like, um, like a blue and white checkered collared shirt, huge jeans. My first impression of Sean is that he, he was very confident and he knew exactly what he wanted and he was very persuasive. We'd do the boat show, home show, car show, Oktoberfest, beer fest, and then in between, you know, have like parties down here and it's just this big empty room full of love sacks. Turn the lights down, turn the music up and it was always a party at Love Sack HQ. Every college kid in Utah knew what a love sack was. I knew it was a legitimate product. I didn't know really much about the company and how big or small it was, but it didn't really matter to me. I could tell in about five seconds from meeting Sean that this is not just anybody, that you know, he's definitely a force. It's sucking me dry, want to quit it. One last shot at a trade show in Chicago to see if we can't sell more than one at a time. The van would break, the shredder would break. We had to fix things constantly, buy more fabric. And here I am on my last week, waiting tables at Xiao Li Chinese restaurant two blocks up. The Winter Olympics are just a few months out. The whole world is going to descend on downtown Salt Lake City. And, and then we get this giant order from the Limited Two. They want 12,000 little love sacks by Christmas. On September 1st of 2001, we have a full container load of tiny, shrunken down, perfectly folded little love sacks show up that we've got to put foam in over the next uh, 60 days to ship to the Limited Two in time for Christmas. Following the ventures of Sean is basically what it was. That's the truth. <laughs> so I'm standing in the spot where the original Love Sack factory would have been. It's long since blown out. We were able to get the hay buster inside, but it had to be powered by a tractor that had to remain outside because of course it ran on diesel fuel, blowing smoke up into the air. At the time they were redoing this street to put in the tracks and there was all this dirt everywhere, landfill that they were moving around to sort of level the street with. So we ended up paying the dude on the giant backhoe to push 
a mound of dirt and pack it down in front of our bay door so that we could back the tractor up on top of the dirt and connect it to the hay buster every morning to run the factory from. We ran two, sometimes three shifts a day. So between, you know, working nights at UPS and Sean doing an early shift and then me showing up and taking over because he had been up half the night working and then me coming in, working with another crew and then sometimes another crew would come in even after me and run another shift. Complete the order, realize we have no other customers. We go to the furniture stores, they all laugh at us, tell us it's a stupid idea. So we open our own store at a mall in downtown Salt Lake City where I've grown up and gone through school. Finally was able to pay myself once I started working in the Love Sack store, November 17th, 2001. We opened uh, right down here, right in the center of the Gateway Mall. People love it. They come in, they buy sacks, they flop down, they share it with friends. We're doing six figures in just the first few weeks and we promptly ran off, opened a second store down the, down the road in Provo, Utah. To love Sack at that point, we just sold Sacks and we were a franchise model. We went from, I think, 30 stores when I was there to 86, I think was the final count. These locations became, you know, lots of blood, lots of sweat, and lots of tears. But our fingerprints are on every single one of them. Uh, first met Sean, <laughs> him and Tiffany were driving around to all of the Love Sack locations. We took three Super Sacks. We went down to a high school, uh, stacked them up, and then uh, Sean and I in his truck uh, went like 80 miles an hour and smashed into the Love Sacks. So my first time <laughs> meeting Sean was doing some like dumb thing together and uh, I loved it. Probably one of the most energetic human beings I've ever encountered in my life. Incredibly, incredibly passionate about his product. So the bus was this 40 foot bus, shag carpet, tiger stripe print chenille covers. There was a disco ball. There was nine TVs. There was, I think, six subwoofers, two 15s down in the base. It had an intercom system so you could talk to people outside, Alpine Swirl for a um, movie sack in the back. This thing was crazy. So I, I drove that over the course of a year and a half uh, cross country, probably three or four times. There's really old videos of Sean doing donuts in the bus. One of the brokers is like, I need you to do me a favor. Anything, what do you need? And they're like, look, can you please tell Sean to take the video down that he has posted on YouTube of him doing donuts in the parking lot? Because one of the underwriters saw it and was like, we're not writing this company. What we had created at that point was, they called it the vibe. And that was very real. I mean, you'd come holiday, you'd see all these mall rat kids that are bringing their parents to buy sacks finally. And they were enamored by their experience with Love Sack. But it's not so dissimilar to how people feel about our showrooms now. They love our associates, they love the experience, they love you know, how the brand makes them feel. And it's just uh, a bit more elevated than it was then. We have 30, 40 locations when I get recruited to be on Richard Branson's reality TV show in 2005. We'll offer 16 contestants the biggest prize in reality TV history. The name's Branson, Sir Richard Branson. And to win that prize, he's going to give them an adventure like no other. 10 countries, five continents, one world. I'm looking for a billionaire in the rough. They think they're going to win a job with Branson, but what they don't know is they're going to win Branson's job. I feel like a terrible wife saying this, but I did not want him to go on that show. I hated the idea. I didn't know what the show was. I had never heard of it, it was brand new. I didn't even know who Richard Branson was at the time. And then as it got closer and I found out more about what it was, I thought that it sounded legitimate enough to consider. And it turned out to be a huge blessing in so many ways. 100 people now, and we will employ thousands. And what it really, really, really comes down to is that those thousands of people, every single one of them have dreams. So they kept me hidden and they kind of just threw me out on camera in the lights without any warning that someone snapped a mic on me and like shoved me out there. Sure.
Heard us. One million dollars sound. Anyway, a moment like this uh, shouldn't be exper experienced alone. Oh my and um, so... Um... And <laughs> that was it. I didn't know any of like the cast. I didn't know who Sarah Blakely was at the time that she was part of the cast. I didn't, I had never met Richard Branson. I mean, this all, it was really overwhelming, no but it was awesome. It was awesome oh seeing gosh. this. It wasn't just some weird thing he had been doing for six to eight weeks. Like this was, this was for real. It was pretty cool. A million dollars on TV. Of course, I'm two million in debt. What are you going to do? But we invest in the company. We raise more money through venture capital. They want to bankrupt the company, start over. It's devastating, embarrassing. We move the company to Stanford, Connecticut. Start over with just 12 locations and probably 12 employees and build the thing back up to 30, 40, 50 locations. We invent sectionals along the way because in that very first store, there's a couch in the corner to look pretty with the sacks. People want to buy this thing. We can't sell it to them. If only we could shrink this couch down the way we shrink a love sack down, that'd be amazing. You know, I'm a Wall Street guy. I've been an investor or a banker for about 40 years at this point. One of the guys uh, who works with me, called me up one day and said, I was in a mall, I saw this really cool company, we gotta go meet them. I said, forget it, it's a furniture business. The stores are gigantic, the inventory doesn't turn over, you have to finance your customers, they come back once every 12 years, and they hate your guts. He said, the company's 20 minutes from your house, give me a half an hour. 15 minutes into the meeting with Sean, I said, okay, how much money do you need and when do you need it? We were at this showroom, this factory showroom, and we were staring at this very modern couch. Uh, and I just envisioned like if I had a chainsaw, I could cut this thing up into different pieces, right? And they'd all be separate. And so we explained that to the, to the factory people. And of course, they looked at us like we were crazy. But I thought if we can just get them separate and then find a way to put them back together, we would have something you know, quite unique that's not out there. Sectionals are washable, changeable, movable, stackable, shippable, but we're trying to now sell against some of the most sophisticated furniture companies on the planet. We try everything, rugs, bowls, lamps, baskets, decorative accessories. We become a little home furnishing store in the mall. We've got 20, 30, 40 locations. Nothing's working though the way it should. We jettison all that stuff. We decided we have something unique and we're gonna double down and triple down on what we have that's unique. Keep it simple. You got a winner, play the winner. Focus is a direct consumer brand. The sectionals, take a risk, TV advertising. Let's see how this goes. It's blowing up, sectionals are exploding. 60, 70, 80 locations. Take the company public in 2018 with 100 million in sales. It's one of those things that you don't know, is it ever gonna happen or not? And so, when it did happen, it was just so surreal to think that we had worked so hard over the years to finally get there and actually accomplish it. It was pretty cool. It just, it defies gravity. I tried to hide it because I'm supposed to be the tough Wall Street guy, but I literally almost cried. The day we were standing in Times Square and the name went up on the board, I remember hugging him and it was because honestly, I couldn't believe we had gotten there. From there, the sky's the limit. The company's worth two, three hundred million overnight. Can't believe it. We have 80, 100 now, hundreds of locations finally into the 2020s, uh, thousands of employees, fastest growing furniture company in the United States, depending on the year we're talking about. It's quintupled, it's approaching a billion in sales. And I couldn't be prouder because along the way, not only have we sold a ton of stuff, but more importantly, we discovered through sectionals that things could be built to last a lifetime and designed to evolve with you as your life changes, as your family grows, as you, as you move and morph. And that philosophy called design for life has become our purpose for existing, bringing products that can really sustain. Our culture and our people have always been what mattered to us most. That was always, always what Sean embedded in my brain. Don't lose our culture, don't lose our culture, don't lose our culture. And I can sit here and say, we haven't. And we won't because he won't let us. It was a battle to get here, and I'm sure it'll be a battle to get to the next level, but it gives you a sense that a lot more is achievable. 
Sean has definitely evolved his products with his evolving family. When he first started this, he wasn't married, he didn't have kids, he didn't have pets, none of that meant anything to him. You could have a perfect white sofa over there that stayed pristine. But then life happens and you have friends or you have pets or you have kids. It's been fun to watch Sean kind of see his family really use his product. Like, it, you know, it doesn't get better than watching it in your own home and experiencing what your customers are experiencing. Not to mention we recycle more plastic bottles than any company on the planet to home deck fabric because we're selling millions and millions of these things and they're all covered in nothing but plastic bottle recycled fabric. When things can sustain like that, and you could possibly have it the rest of your life, that's a truly sustainable solution and ultimately you're able to buy less stuff and buy better. And that's our hope at Lovestack. We will become not only one of the biggest uh, brands in home furnishings, but ultimately we, we hope to become the most beloved brand in home furnishings in the whole world.